58-year-old Caucasian male presents for a comprehensive periodontal examination. Upon examining his patient intake form and vitals, my group members and I are able to determine the proper plan of action. His medical history includes a myocardial infarction three years ago, atherosclerosis, hypertension, diabetes, and cirrhosis of the liver. Medication being used by the patient is adenosyl, nifedipine, insulin, and 81 milligrams of aspirin. His social history includes smoking and drinking. The patient was taken back, and upon taking vitals, blood pressure appeared to be 180 over 110, with a pulse of 80 beats per minute. My group members and I will take you step by step through the systematic treatment planning of this patient and how the diagnosis of periodontitis is determined. Significance of our patient's systemic conditions and disease played a role in his periodontitis diagnosis. As previously stated, our patient presents with cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, cirrhosis of the liver, and has a social history of smoking and drinking, which essentially categorizes him as a high-risk patient. In patients with diabetes, their cardiovascular and periodontal disease tend to be more severe than the average person. In addition to that, his social history of smoking and drinking were not only contributing to the severity of his cardiovascular disease, but were also the most significant risk factor for the development of his periodontitis. With this patient, I will consult a PCP. I will make sure that they are medically cleared for periodontal treatment. With regards to the blood pressure reading, this is indicative of hypertensive crisis. I will stop any treatment and send them to the hospital immediately. With regards to diabetes, I am looking for HbA1c levels, anything less than 7%. Anything higher than 7%, I will suspend treatment and make sure that they are getting the, that number under 7% before I perform any dental treatment. With a hypertensive situation, I will make sure that I will monitor their, their levels if I am performing any treatment on them post, you know, your hospital visit, I will make sure that I'm paying attention to the drugs and avoid any drugs that will raise the blood pressure. Our management of this patient involved many modifications. Prior to this examination, we took his vitals, which read 180 over 110 with a pulse rate of 80 beats per minute. That eliminated the possibility of white coat syndrome due to his medical history of type 2 hypertension. We also did a thorough oral cancer examination because of his social history of smoking. We scheduled shorter appointment times, provided conscious sedation, supplemental oxygen, and altered his positioning to sit upright during procedures because of his myocardial cardio infraction three years prior to this visit. We also chose to perform non-surgical periodontal therapy to not only reduce the periodontal disease, but to help improve his glycemic control in HbA1c. Systemic antibiotics, tetracycline and doxycycline were used along with nitrates to aid in his treatment management as well. To ensure that this patient receives proper care, it is important to have a comprehensive understanding of their current medical status. Consultation with the patient's primary care physician and cardiologist will ensure that all of the necessary information is obtained prior to starting any periodontal treatment. Obtaining consultation in regard to the dosage and side effects of the patient's medications and understanding the progress of the patient's diabetes, blood pressure, and cardiovascular disease respectively can provide insight to any premedication needed prior to starting periodontal treatment. Consultation will also clarify all indications and contraindications for treatment as well. Understanding these aspects of care will ensure that the patient does not suffer any post-operative sensitivity that could jeopardize their subsequent health or recovery. The objective of an adequately written medical consult is to relay all of the necessary information needed to the physician in order for them to have a well-rounded idea of the patient's history and chief complaints. The medical consultation must be concise and contain pertinent and specific questions for the physician to address, as well as involve verbiage that is easy to understand for non-dental health care providers. The written medical consultation should include components of the patient's basic information such, such as the personal history like their demographic and personal data, their medical history stating any past illnesses, allergies, or medications being utilized, their dental history, as well as the patient's chief complaint in the history of their present illness, illness, which should be written in closed captions that explicably states what the patient is describing. 
The written document should include what was inspected during the examination and any x-rays taken during the visit. The medical consultation must have an overview of the treatment plan that allows the physician to have a well-rounded idea of what the dentist has inspected. The ASA classification was developed by the American Society of Anesthesiologists to classify patients based on their physical status and their risk for surgical development. Our patient would be given an ASA classification of three due to the presence of severe systemic diseases like liver cirrhosis, poorly controlled hypertension, and diabetes. These systemic diseases would limit our patient's activity and cause him to exhibit signs of distress whenever he undergoes physiological and psychological stress. The first drug that the patient is prescribed is atenolol. Some of the side effects can include difficulty breathing, swelling of the tongue, and the throat. This is extremely important for facilitating care for the patient because of the water used in different dental procedures. Secondly, our patient is prescribed nifedipine, which can lead to joint pain, which is important for the TMJ, and inflammation of the face, arms, legs, and the feet. The patient is taking nifedipine and atenolol for hypertension, insulin for diabetes, and 81 milligrams of aspirin. The patient's physician should be consulted prior to dental treatment to discuss the medications, diabetic and cardiovascular management, as well as any preoperative considerations. For hypertensive management, the blood pressure should be taken at every appointment. They should be short. The patient should take their medications and diet as recommended. You want to limit the amount of epinephrine. 2% lidocaine with epinephrine 1 to 100,000. And you want to seat the patient from supine position solely so that they're to avoid orthostatic hypotension. Diabetic management. HbA1c should be less than 7%. Surgical treatment only on well-controlled diabetic patients, and you want to recognize any signs and symptoms of hypo and hyperglycemia. Aspirin should not be stopped. Smoking causes structural alternations to the lipidate drive 3 hydroxyl fatty acid profile in saliva. This fatty acid profile is consistent with the oral microflora of reduced inflammatory potential. Smokers exhibit a decrease in several pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines and certain regulators of T-cells and natural killer cells. This immunosuppressant effect of smoking contributes to susceptibility to periodontitis. Alcohol consumption decreases salivary secretion causing xerostomia, also known as dry mouth. Saliva helps neutralize the acids produced by plaque. Hence, a lack of saliva can cause an accumulation of these acids leading to the early stages of periodontal disease. Bacterial plaque is the primary etiological factor associated with periodontitis, yet there are several other variables that may place an individual for developing the disease. Two of these variables include tobacco smoking and diabetes, and they're defined as risk factors. There's a direct relationship that exists between periodontal disease and smoking, and the prevalence of severe Periodontitis is significantly higher in patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Several other less cl clearly defined risk factors include and can part be part of the risk assessment for each patient. These include genetic factors, age, gender, socioeconomic status, HIV, stress, osteoporosis and infrequent dental visit and if you have a previous history of periodontal disease and bleeding on probing. There are also secondary or local contributing factors for this disease. They include secondary or occlusal forces which on unhealthy periodontium is weakened by periodontitis. There's parafunctional occlusal forces, which is tooth-to-tooth -to -tooth contact when not chewing, such as clenching and grinding. And your habits such as tongue th uh, thrusting and mouth breathing, which dries out the gingival tissue in the anterior region, and improper use of toothpicks or interdental aids. By delineating the systematic treatment planning of this 58-year-old Caucasian male, my group and I came to many conclusions that would aid in the proper treatment and care, as well as prevent any mishaps. A little information goes a long way, and as professionals, we must take many aspects into consideration when caring for any patient. We thank you for watching, and hopefully together, we can continue to learn and educate others on the necessity of oral care.